Singapore is building the largest artificial islands ever, but not for the reasons you might think. A third of the nation sits less than 5 meters above sea level, and scientists warn the ocean could send waves 4 to 5 meters higher by the end of this century. Past mega-projects expanded the shoreline, but regional sand bands and a swelling population leave the city with nowhere left to run. Now, for over $100 billion, Singapore is betting its future on a new kind of land, three long islands engineered to beat the rising tide. But can this audacious plan actually save an entire country, or is the risk even greater than it appears? Singapore stands as one of the world's most densely populated cities, with more than 8,000 people living in every square kilometer. But the city's real vulnerability isn't just the sheer number of residents packed into its urban core. It's the land itself, low, flat, and perilously close to the sea. About a third of Singapore's total area, roughly 220 square kilometers, lies less than 5 meters above sea level. This isn't just a strip of coastline, its entire neighborhoods, bustling commercial centers, public housing blocks, schools, and even vital parts of Changi Airport. In these districts, the difference between a normal day and a crisis can be as little as a few centimeters of water. Climate models from the Center for Climate Research. Singapore and international agencies paint a stark picture. By the end of this century, global sea levels could rise by a full meter, driven by melting ice sheets and warming oceans. But the real danger comes when nature piles on. During a severe storm, wind and tide can combine to create a surge four to five meters above today's high tide line. In a city where land is scarce and every square meter is accounted for, there is no higher ground to escape to. A surge of that magnitude would overwhelm sea walls, flood subway lines, cut off power to entire districts, and force hundreds of thousands to evacuate. The city's intricate web of expressways, water treatment plants, and electrical substations, many built within this vulnerable elevation, would be exposed to the full force of the sea. The risk isn't confined to the waterfront. The east and southeast, including Marine Parade, Bedok, and Tampines, are home to well over a million people, many living within this low-lying band. Here, daily life unfolds in the shadow of a rising tide. The threat is not abstract or distant. Every major storm, every record-breaking king tide, is a warning shot. For Singapore, this is an existential challenge, one that tests the ingenuity and resolve of an entire nation. The government has called it a matter of national survival. Projects like Long Island are not just about reclaiming land, they are about building a shield, a collective effort to hold back the sea and protect the future of a city with nowhere else to go. Singapore's coastline today is the product of more than 60 years of relentless engineering. Since the 1960s, the city-state has redrawn its map again and again, expanding Marina Bay from tidal flats building Changi Airport on reclaimed ground, and creating East Coast Park atop what was once open sea. Each of these projects added vital space for homes, parks, and industry. But behind every new shoreline lies a single, stubborn ingredient, sand. No country on Earth imports more sand per capita than Singapore. Over the decades, barges have hauled in millions of tons from neighboring countries, sometimes reshaping entire river deltas just to feed the city's appetite for land. In the early years, sand seemed limitless. Indonesia, Malaysia, and Cambodia all supplied vast quantities, fueling the transformation of Singapore's waterfront. But as the scale of reclamation grew, so did the consequences. Environmental damage in source countries sparked diplomatic tensions and, by the 2000s, a wave of export bans. Indonesia halted sand shipments in 2007, Malaysia followed suit, and Cambodia imposed restrictions soon after. Suddenly, the supply lines that made expansion possible were under threat, and Singapore's planners faced a new reality. The old playbook was running out of road. 
Past mega projects like Marina Bay and East Coast Park stand as monuments to what sand can build, but also to what it can destroy. Regional bans forced Singapore to search farther afield, driving up costs and drawing scrutiny from environmental groups. At the same time, scientists began to tally the price paid in lost coral reefs, mangroves, and fisheries, both at home and abroad. The urgency of climate adaptation collided with the limits of traditional reclamation. By the late 2010s, it was clear that simply importing more sand was no longer sustainable, either politically or ecologically. This crossroads set the stage for a new approach. State agencies like the Urban Redevelopment Authority and the Public Utilities Board began to rethink how land could be created, protected, and managed. Lessons from decades of sand-based expansion and the political fallout that followed now shape every decision about Singapore's future coastline. The Long Island Project is not just another round of reclamation. It's an answer to the hard limits exposed by the city's own history and a test of whether a nation built on borrowed land can chart a different course. Three new islands, Long Island East, Central, and West, will rise from the shallow waters just off Singapore's east coast, stretching in a chain nearly 13 kilometers long. Together, they'll cover about 800 hectares, which is twice the size of Marina Bay. But this isn't just about gaining more land. The design transforms the coastline itself, creating a shield that stands between the city and the open sea. Behind these islands, a protected waterway will be sealed off to form Singapore's 18th freshwater reservoir. This new basin, cradled between the mainland and the artificial islands, will be ringed by tidal gates and high-capacity pumps. During normal tides, the gates remain open, letting water flow and people enjoy the new waterfront. When a storm approaches or the tide surges, the gates close and the pumps kick in, keeping both the reservoir and the city dry. It's a scaled-up version of the Marina Barrage, but on a far greater scale, with enough capacity to safeguard entire neighborhoods and critical infrastructure. The vision for Long Island goes beyond defense. Each island is planned as a multi-use zone, blending three distinct functions. First, there are the residential and commercial waterfront districts. Early planning documents estimate enough space for as many as 60,000 new homes, plus offices, shops, and restaurants, an urban extension that could reshape the East Coast skyline. Then come the recreation parks and beaches. 20 kilometers of new parkland will line both the reservoir and the seaward edge, offering cycling paths, sports fields, and open lawns. These parks will be the longest continuous green corridor ever built in Singapore, connecting existing neighborhoods to fresh public spaces and sandy beaches. At the eastern end, the islands link directly to Changi's expanding aviation and logistics zone. This area is reserved for future airport facilities, logistics hubs, and transport links, ensuring that the nation's economic lifeline can keep pace with rising air traffic and global trade. The zoning plan is designed to flex with demand, allowing for new industries, research campuses, or even more public amenities as needs evolve across the century. From above, Long Island will look like a ribbon of city, park, and water, all engineered to work together. It's not just another land reclamation, it's an entire waterfront ecosystem, built for resilience, growth, and daily life in a city that has no room for retreat. The backbone of Long Island will be built from a fleet of massive precast concrete caissons, each one engineered to withstand the relentless assault of salt water, waves, and shifting tides for at least 150 years. About 200 of these structures, each stretching roughly 50 meters in length, will be lined up and locked together to form the island's perimeter. This approach is nothing like the old days of dumping sand by the barge load. Instead, it's a modular, factory-style operation, more like assembling a giant set of Lego blocks than pouring a continuous wall into the sea. Production happens on land, in dedicated casting yards set up near deep water docks. Here, teams work around the clock, pouring high-strength marine concrete into massive steel forms. The concrete mix isn't ordinary. Special additives slow down corrosion, reduce shrinkage, and keep out chloride ions that can eat away at steel. 
Every caisson needs to cure for days, sometimes weeks, before it's strong enough to move. At full tilt, the plan is to roll out up to four caissons every week. That's a pace rarely seen outside the world's largest marine engineering projects, and it takes a small army of workers, engineers, and logistics managers to keep the line moving. Each unit is reinforced with prefabricated steel cages, designed to resist cracking and absorb the pounding force of the waves. The outer walls are thick, up to a meter in some places, with layers of waterproofing and joint seals that keep water out and protect the steel inside. As the caissons leave the casting yard, they're floated out to sea on barges, then lowered with pinpoint precision onto a prepared seabed. GPS and laser-guided systems ensure that every piece lands within centimeters of its target. Once in place, the caissons are grouted and locked together, forming a continuous, watertight barrier. The real advantage of this modular system isn't just speed, it's adaptability. If sea levels rise faster than expected, the caissons can be swapped out or stacked higher, raising the entire barrier without having to rebuild from scratch. If a section is damaged, it can be replaced with minimal disruption. Compared to traditional sand fill, these structures settle less over time, reducing the risk of uneven ground and costly repairs down the line. The engineering teams behind this effort are drawing on lessons from global projects like the Dutch Delta Works and Singapore's own polders at Pulau Tekong, Pulau Tekong. But the scale here is unprecedented. Each caisson weighs thousands of tons and must resist not just today's storms, but whatever the climate throws at Singapore a century from now. Regular inspections, underwater drone surveys, and advanced sensors will monitor every joint and surface for signs of wear, allowing for maintenance long before problems become visible. In the end, it's this modular, marine-grade backbone that will let Singapore build higher, faster, and smarter, creating not just new land, but a flexible shield against an uncertain future. Long Island's shield isn't just concrete and steel, it's a living, breathing system, one that must react in real time to the sea's every move. Under normal conditions, the reservoir gates stay open. Water flows freely and the city enjoys the new waterfront. But when a tropical storm barrels in or the tides climb higher than forecast, the entire operation shifts into high alert. Gates slam shut and a fleet of high-capacity pumps roar to life. These aren't ordinary pumps. Each unit, scaled up from the Marina Barrage playbook, is built to move tens of thousands of liters every second. During a major surge, the system could draw 40 to 80 megawatts at peak, enough to power a small town just to keep water levels from rising. That kind of load can't rely on a single power line. Redundant grid connections, diesel generators, and backup batteries stand ready in case the main supply fails. Engineers have even begun piloting hydrogen fuel cells, hoping to one day cut the carbon footprint of these emergency runs. But so far, no one knows exactly how much energy the system will consume each year. The only certainty is that as storms get stronger and sea levels creep up, the pumps will be called into action more often and the energy bill will keep climbing. For Singapore's planners, balancing flood protection with sustainability is no longer a theoretical exercise. It's a daily calculation, played out every time the sky turns dark and the tide begins to rise. Singapore's history of land reclamation has come at a steep environmental price. Over the past 60 years, nearly 60% of the nation's coral reefs have vanished, casualties of dredging, infill, and the relentless push to expand the shoreline. Marine biologists warn that new construction along the East Johor Strait could erase some of the last surviving habitats, threatening fisheries and biodiversity that once flourished in these waters. The risks go beyond lost coral. Excavating the seabed releases stored carbon, while murky plumes from construction can smother what remains of fragile ecosystems. To address these concerns, the government has mandated a full environmental impact assessment for Long Island, 
scheduled to run from 2024 through 2029. This process, led by the Public Utilities Board and the Urban Redevelopment Authority, will scrutinize everything from sediment flows to the fate of local marine species, while collecting public feedback from residents, environmental groups, and businesses who depend on the coast. Early drafts and leaked studies suggest the debate will be intense, with calls for artificial reefs, stricter monitoring, and compensation for affected communities. Financing the project is just as contested. With a national sea level defense envelope projected at 100 billion Singapore dollars, the Ministry of Finance is weighing options, phased annual budgets, infrastructure bonds, and if absolutely necessary, drawing from Singapore's strategic reserves. Each path carries its own risks and trade-offs, fueling a public debate over how much to spend, who should pay, and what future generations will inherit. The stakes are as much about governance and trust as they are about engineering. Singapore's Long Island project isn't happening in isolation. Around the world, other coastal cities have built massive defenses to hold back the sea, but none combine urban growth and climate adaptation quite like this. The Dutch Delta Works stretches across entire estuaries, using giant floodgates and movable barriers to protect millions of people from North Sea storms. In London, the Thames Barrier rises from the river, ready to swing shut and shield the city center from tidal surges. Japan's super levees run through parts of Tokyo, built high and wide to stop tsunamis and typhoons. Each of these projects answers a single question. How do you keep the water out? Singapore's response is different. The plan is to build three artificial islands, double the size of Marina Bay, that will defend the coast, expand the city, and create a new freshwater reservoir, all in one move. But this approach raises questions that even the world's best engineers can't fully answer. Can new parks and artificial reefs really replace what's lost beneath the waves? Will future generations have the same access to the waterfront, or will new barriers cut off the sea? How will Singapore balance the energy demands of massive pumps with its climate goals? And if sea levels rise faster than predicted, can the modular caisson system keep up? These are open questions, not just for Singapore, but for every coastal city watching this experiment unfold. The world is paying close attention to see if Long Island can deliver on its promise, or if it will become a cautionary tale for the climate era. One in three square kilometers of Singapore sits below five meters above sea level, a stark fact that has driven six decades of land reclamation and now the Long Island project. Over 800 hectares, three new islands and a freshwater reservoir will reshape the east coast, anchored by 200 modular caissons designed for 150 years of service. Yet with past reclamation linked to a 60% decline in local reefs, and with the project's true energy footprint still uncalculated, key questions remain about environmental and operational costs. Public documents confirm feasibility studies and environmental assessments are set through 2029, but final decisions on financing, biodiversity offsets, and public access have yet to be made. For Singapore, the Long Island plan is not just about gaining land. It is a test of how a city confronts rising seas while balancing growth, security, and the limits of engineering.